Hey guys, Sierra Bailey here with Excel Commercial Real Estate. The video you're watching ties into our event in June, Accelerate. If you want to learn more about what you see today, scan the QR code on your screen or click the link in the description to get your tickets now before early bird pricing runs out. Enjoy the video. So acquisition-wise, so when you first got started, how did you go about finding properties? Yeah, so whether it was you know, uh, the lipstick stuff to what you're doing now, where it's, you know, you buy, you just buy uh, land that you can build a luxury $2 million home in Green Hill Zone. So for when I first got started, the, 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 the opportunities were, uh, were a lot more greater which means you can find stuff on MLS. Um, but I would encourage, I mean, like, and I don't know, and I, I'll find stuff on MLS, but I also would encourage to people to real, to partner up with people that really know rehabs and know those numbers because I had to get those help initially too. You know, I had to, I had people to kind of fine tune what, I, what I'm actually getting myself into. Um, and I did it through rent. So there's probably many avenues of what you can do to, find those partnerships to find who can help you to start the lipstick rehabs if that's what you're interested in doing. Um, but eventually I got, in, I got into where I learned so much about rehabs that like I, I, bet I for a few years, I just went on um, Bob Park's auction. Like there's tons of auction sites, right? So you have Bill Colton, Bob Parks, um, it's like jcash auction.com auction.com i bought stuff off auction.com but you get to the point where you get confident enough to where you can go to that specific auction within 10 minutes of during the auction or at the auction to look at the house figure out your numbers uh and i and my and my two not my two main things that i do when i go to uh, visit homes um like rehab homes is i open up the crawl space and sometimes they're locked, so you got to really fight, fight into it to get into the crawl space. Make sure it's all dry. Walk around the foundation. Make sure there's no cracks, right? So, there, so you know that this is a solid house and it's got good, good uh, water dissipation around the property. And then the, and then once you have those two, once you have the, once you understand crawl space and foundation, uh, and, and that it's okay, then everything else on the inside is pretty standard, right? So, like you're, you're, you know, if you got to, if you got to got out of house you got to be a bathroom or a kitchen that's that cost is basically the same for any single property but you might have a little more uh cost in like demoing plaster and 1950s like you know one inch thick uh tile bathrooms and cast iron tubs right i'm sure if, some, if you guys have done it <laughs> that's not easy to do right so uh, so 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 those are all like what i consider uh predictable costs but what's not predictable is making sure that the foundation the cross space structurally the product is sound right so that's my and i was able to acquire and flip a few deals at auction which to some people it's like it's very difficult to say I want to go buy this two three hundred thousand dollar house in ten minutes, right? But if you have, if you really have, can do several projects where you're lipsticking and you gain the confidence, you sold it, you made a profit, and you keep adding on the skill sets, then it's not that difficult to actually get to where where you can actually assess a property within ten minutes of being there. I mean, it's not it's it's not. It, I promise you, it doesn't require a four-year degree to, to do that, <laughs> you know, so you can do it. <laughs> so did you go from, um, so your W-2, at what point did you become a general contractor and um, and at what point did you get your real estate license? Yeah, so uh, in, in year one, which is 2017, I immediately got my, uh, got my um, real estate license. And I would encourage everyone to get it for a couple of reasons. Obviously, obviously saving money is one of is one of them for for you getting your license. Because, but for me, it was Saturday morning at seven o'clock when I wake up and I'm having coffee and I see a deal come up on MLS. No matter who's your best real estate agent, they ain't gonna get it as fast as you can because you're because 
at seven at seven ten, I'm putting that offer in. I'm sending them a pre-approval letters or cash balances on my bank account. I'm telling them what do I need to get it done. I I need just need a couple of days to do to do to to do the diligence. And you're you're pretty much like by by seven thirty to eight o'clock in that one hour, you're way ahead of the game because you got all your stuff together, you know, at that point. And um, that's it's a speed that I that I miss. So that was a re primary reason why I got uh, got my got my license. And obviously, it does um, help with uh, with your numbers too. That was able to, if that's something that you guys are interested in as far as uh, as far as working or not or being, working with an agent or not or, or yourself being an agent um but sec but as as i grew and, and i did some and i did some traditional real estates for for a little bit but as at one point i i decided to tell myself you got it's always to me it's always about your focus right that like some people some people you know may be like i want to be traditional real estate i want to rehab i want to do multifamily i want to do infills I want, that's great but i i don't I, I just don't see how someone like i have a family and a six-year-old i just don't have time to do everything you know i don't i don't have time to go show houses and this this time i gotta put this hat on put that hat on because it's, it's too much so i i've really just honed in to just this is my scope of what I do. I do Davidson County residential infill real estate. I do. I don't care if it's high end like Green Hills. I don't care if it's East Nashville, which is becoming pretty high end. This it's but it's but it's still the same box. The box that that box in Green Hills just became five thousand square feet, whereas the box in East Nashville is two thousand square feet. Now I have a, now there's a lot of details behind the delivery of those those products in those categories, but for the same, for the most part, it's the same process of analyzing those deals and the numbers. So, um, but to your- But I was, I was gonna just say, cause so I know for the longest time too, and you know, you, you were talking about your organization, right? You, you have a couple of project managers. I, I know, but I know for the longest time, you were was it. on every job you were doing, you were, you were dealing with the subs, you were doing everything. And I know you're very much a hands-on type person. And, but that worked for you, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm still out in the fields for, yeah. uh, right. to, to manage the projects too. Um, but what I, what I don't have to do anymore, uh, and I, is that I don't have to wait for the concrete truck to be delivered with a concrete pump truck to pour the footers, you know, so if I, the footers are good, then, you know, my, you know, yeah. my job for that particular site is done <laughs> for the day. Um, but, but that's what the pro that's what we have. Uh, that's why, that's where you can scale. I never, I never lose project quality. I feel like I'm in still very in touch with the projects that I'm working with, but we can, but I, but in order to scale, I have, it's like, you know, if you guys are at, hire people that work for you you got to have a sense of uh ability to let go right and and in my books if you can if you can if i can let go and be comfortable with someone doing a b plus job then you, that that job can be uh can be let uh, can be transferable to to that team member so when you have a project going on and uh somebody wants to invest money on your deal how do you know that that's going to be a good fit for you if that investor you know is a good fit for your business um and not gonna you know and not gonna be a conflict uh with you uh in project or, or you know a lot of things can happen with the investors where um they want to know every single thing you're doing sure. how much money you put it into the deal how much money you're going to pay them, and they're very difficult how do you pick and choose that investor if you have any investors who wants to invest in the deal? So um, repeat the question for those that are on Zoom. So the 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 question the question from Mr. Mr. Santos. Santos is that he wants to know how do I choose and pick the investors that we have for the projects that we have, right? Essentially. Right. Uh, and then we had initially had ten investors, and we and we brought them down to less less than half of that. Uh, and the reason and the, the thing 
the biggest and, and from from what your presentation with Ben on syndications and what we do, it's the biggest difference between those two investors is Ben is buying like maybe a 50, 50 million dollar apartment complex, right? And then for you to do that fifty million dollar apartment complex, you may the bank may say you got to put twenty percent down, right? That's ten million, correct? So he his job is to find how many people he needs to 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 to, to be able to syndicate ten million dollars of down payment. That's his primary job, and 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 a syndicator typically gets a big percentage of a of because he's a general partner over all the syndicators that are that that are investing in that fifty million dollar deal, right? He could have ten, he could have a hundred. I don't, I, I don't, you know, syndications all come in different fit form and fashion, right? So he could have one fifty million dollar apartment deal that could have potentially, let's say, for example, twenty investors that syndicates into the down payment of that particular apartment. What I do, and what I have done is there. If we do if we do one property in East Nashville, which means you buy one property, tear it down, build two tall and skinnies, because everyone knows tall and skinnies in East Nashville, right? So that project, that lot and that project itself is all with just one partner. There's no, there's no, there's no multi, there's no two, there, there's no two investors on one project. So it's very clear if that project has a problem, if that project only is only has only one funding partner. And, uh, and if that project has a problem, they only have to deal with me. That's it. So that's it's very clean, you know. So and actually, to be honest with you, we because we have reduced the number of investors, uh, we have one. We most of our investors do mul uh, multiple properties at the same time. So that's the biggest difference is we don't. So to answer your question, we don't bring investors in at the middle or at the end or. Uh, or, or at what that when we when we contract a specific project to be done within our company, that project is being funded by one person. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Would you consider um, getting to the point where you start a fund to scale? So you're talking about RIT, a RIT, uh, like some something like a RIT. Like a, uh, funding. Yeah, like a re like a refunding right or open door capital yeah open door capital i mean like we have like we have one company that we work with out of orange county california it's not a reit it's just it's just one company that has more that has multiple investors there and i just deal with one um uh, general partner i guess from california and he and he manages so our big, big, the biggest thing I told them is that I, re I really don't want to work with 20 of your other guys that's behind you. I really just want to work with one person from Orange County. And if you can be the face of that, then we will work together. But I, I can't take 20 phone calls from 20 people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not that's not that's not how I can. And you don't want that because then it inundates me and, 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 it, and it's and it's you're going to you're going to lose more money by, by doing that. And, and they get it. So. So what's a typical deal structure? You only have one investor and you're on that one project. Are they getting um, interest only payments for a period of time? Do they cash them out at the, at the sale of the project? How, do, how does your structure work? So uh, what's your name is? Lisa. Lisa. So Lisa's question is, um, how does a typical deal work for an investment project uh, that, that, that we do? <laughs> Um, in, in, in my experience, and I can tell you, and I'll tell you generally in my experience is there's so many different ways of working with a funding partner. You know, you, some people work at it as like, you just, uh, we do a project, you pay me a development fee or a builder's fee or a combination of the two. And I have a flat fee and some, or some, some, some people would be like, well, we'll just share the spot, uh, share the profit because, um, and they may not be 50, 50, it may be 40, 60 or 30, 70 or whatever, whatever you decide to do. So there's, there's not like a true method, but you, but what, you, what I have to say is you're, whatever you decide to put in front of that funding partner, you have to show value for what that is and what the numbers are. Right. So and for for us you know we've done it multiple different multiple different ways um 
but we just choose to um, we, we we choose to say I basically tell my clients to say hey if I don't if, if you don't make a dollar I don't make a dollar if you make a dollar I make a dollar or or not fit maybe not 50 50 but maybe somewhere where it makes sense for both of us because what I don't want to do is for me to make a dollar and then you and somehow happens to the economy and then you lose money right and then we're not partners anymore at that point so you so as a developer investor or as a person uh, as a person who wants to add value to that specific project you're going to define what that is you know there's no fun there's no there's no exact right answer to that specific question you're going to have to know are you the developer are you the builder or are you the agent or oh, and then, and then what 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 what, do you, what value do you play in that process and what do you think you should be deserved in terms of compensation for that specific opportunity Thanks for watching this video. If you like what you see, be sure to follow our Generational Wealth Learning Series. On Select Thursdays, we offer cutting edge industry information that would normally cost thousands of dollars. And the best part, our education is absolutely free. If you register through our events page, you can join us live, either in person or over Zoom. In the meantime, like this video, comment down below, and subscribe to our channel so you never miss a beat.